are amazing creations of the human imagination all around the planet. Uh, they're beautiful, they're inspiring, they lift our spirits, they're, they're designed to do this. This is a church designed by a very famous and Im important in the history of architecture designer Le Corbusier, French designer, French modernist, who uh, had a lot to criticize about him, but this is one of the buildings that he did that I, I certainly admire. I've never visited it uh, and I would love to. Um, but as I said earlier on, uh, design is more than just about the great artifacts that we create. And, and you'll hear me use the term artifact a lot. It's a little bit of a social science geek, geek term that I, I like to use because really what we're designing is everything to me is an artifact. The, 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 the creations of art are artifacts and art uh, is a skill for making things. That's all that the word art actually means. The Greeks used it very specifically to refer to the art of making anything and everything, uh, whether it was a wheel or a spoke of the wheel or the uh, beautiful, you know, uh, chariots that, the, that their warriors rode in or uh, a great piece of architecture. It was all art um, and it wasn't necessarily the, the, the sort of the expressive arts that they were referring to. Um, but then we get to the term design and, and we, you know, we get a very hung up in our culture about the word design because we, we sort of lose the separation between design as a noun and design as a verb. Um, and we're here doing a design course that's very, very specifically about design as a verb. We're learning to do something. We're learning to take action in the world, to take creative action. And it's very important to make the distinction that the objects of design, the artifacts, can be anything. We, we, we got a little pigeonholed into a belief system, uh, and I'll, I'll get into that in a, in a lecture in a couple of weeks, actually next week, I believe, um, where we uh, came to believe that uh, to be an object of design it had to be some grand expression, a big famous church or whatever, but that's not true. Every kind of artifact that we make can be designed. We can apply the same sensibility, the same methods, and the same approach uh, to. And that is an approach that I broadly refer to as praxis, that, that constant iteration between our ideas of the reality we want to create and the, and the reality as we create it, that we then reflect back on and find what we like, what we don't like, and we go back into the imagination, we go back into our heads, and we think about something else, and we make it, and we find out what it is. That is the essence, if you like, of the design method, of the design approach. It's about going back and forth, and not trying to prove on paper that something is going to work, we don't know what's going to work, we make it, and then we find out that it doesn't work and we make it better. And then we try it and it works a little bit better and we make it again and we make it better. Um, I got a, a, an email from a student today, I think, who's coming late, I believe, he's not here, um, because he's working on a, on a commission to reform the police in his, in his uh, town. And, uh, as he described what he's doing, it, it, it sounded to me that this was a commission that was going to produce a report rather than produce prototypes of change so that they could try again and again and again until they got it right. And that's a very, very important principle that's at the center of the, the method of praxis, if you like, that, that we're trying to uh, learn here. So that's design as a verb, design as a noun. And it's very, very useful and helpful to always make that distinction. And I'll make a few more distinctions with it. Beyond the artifact and the process, we get hung up because d design is very often referred to as a practice. It's how you do it. And, uh, and then more, more importantly in our culture, as a profession. There are specific professionals who call themselves designers. And it gets very confusing because I'm trained in a design school and you're being trained in a school of theology. So you're not, in quotes, designers, you're theologians or whatever the, the craft is, if you like, that you primarily identify with. But again, my, my firm belief is we're all designers because that's how we're evolved as human beings. Human beings can't help ourselves. We make stuff. And when we make stuff, the only difference between doing it by design and not 
is the question of whether we have clear intention of what we're creating. And when we have clear intention, then the next question is, did we meet our intention? And if we did, then we're a great designer, and if we didn't, we're not. And the challenge that we're, we're trying to take on you is to learn how to always meet our intentions with the, the reality of the things that we create. We can decide later on whether there should be a profession of design for social change, just as there's a profession of architecture or product design or graphic design or interaction design or user experience design. These are all named professions with specific trainings and specific ways of going about doing their work. And we're just creating a, a very new kind of a discipline here when we say uh, a, a, a new kind of profession, if you like, when we say there's a profession of people who design specifically set about to design social change. Okay. So design itself, not just are there specializations within the field of design, because design, as I've just, I just went through a litany, three of the ones that I mentioned didn't even exist 10 years ago. User experience design is the fastest growing design discipline today and design profession. There are people being trained in a discipline called user experience design. These are the people who design all the apps that run on your phone, all the websites, etc. It's broadly referred to today as user experience design because we're not designing just the look and feel of a, an application. We're actually designing what it does, its functionality, and its, it, the, t the totality of how it works and how it is experienced by a user. So, but design itself is a specialization, and it's a specialization that came out of the Industrial Revolution, essentially, uh, when we took the making of things, artisans making stuff, they were designing the stuff as well as making it. And what we did in the Industrial uh, Revolution is we, we specialized the function of conceiving of the things to be made, because we now had things being conceived by one group of people, and made by somebody else. That's not necessarily always the best idea, but it's really how we've, we've become organized. And in some degree, because the way the design is now being applied to different kinds of artifacts, like social, organi you know, social change organizations, etc., cetera, uh, policy, the people who are conceiving of, of necessity need to be much more close to the ground of the, the, the process of, of implementation and actuation, which is why the whole field of innovation is emerging, because that really bridges that gap with people who are not just coming up with ideas, but ensuring that those ideas get out into the world. And that's something else we'll, we'll touch on a little bit more uh, at another time. So a discipline like medicine, uh, which you know we, we take it for granted that medicine today is organized around uh, Special, specialization, specialties that deal with every single part of the human anatomy. Um, design is more and more evolving to have specialist disciplines that apply to different kinds of artifacts. So architecture being you know, the, the building. Uh, but there's a question about how far you can specialize the artifactual nature of the process given that everything is connected in a system. It's something that the medical profession at its own peril has ignored. Um, and the design profession, I think, needs to be very careful before it over-specializes. Because just like the Medici is getting a lot of people in a room together, in my opinion, all those people were designers. And the brilliance of those dinners was that they all got to share ideas, so they all went off to create in their own realm appropriately to and with consideration of the other's sensibilities. So design is a specialization within the realm of making things. And it's just in the last 15, 20 years that we've begun to understand that we make more than pots or decorative items. We, we make everything and everything that is made can be and one would, I would argue, ought to be designed with the same care that this uh, artisan is putting into the creation of that pot that he's making. Design is a very specific kind of specialization. 
it's a form giving specialization. That's what we do as designers. And we, we, we know that in, in the design world that, you know, we, we talk a lot about form, form follows function, etc. But we're all giving form. The forms that we're creating are more abstract. Uh, they, they don't quite necessarily relate to a particular material, uh, which ceramic design, for example, would. Uh, but they do relate to the human experience. And that's where being prepared to give form to the institutions and the elements of, of social engagement um, is a particularly appropriate within a school of theology, in my opinion. Um, and so we, sh we should, re it's, it's very useful in, uh, to me to really think about the form as a root of many, many words. Because uh, we, we have form in everything that we, that we encounter in the world, and everything has a form. So you've all probably heard the famous expression within the design world, form ever, ever follows function. And if there's a, one thing that you can get from this, it's to remind ourselves that, we've, that design in our culture has been grossly misunderstood, and, and style has been thought of in place of design. Design isn't styling. Style is what comes out naturally as an expression of a culture, and it's how we communicate between each other. And if there's a misalignment of expectations in a culture, our, our communication of, through style are going to be distorted. And that's a lot of what's happened in the world of design. We've created a very distortion field, a great distortion field, where we don't really uh, convey and an authentic expression of what is needed in this situation. But at the root of it, the, the people, the person, uh, by, a fellow by the name of Louis Sullivan, who was a student of Frank Lloyd Wright, was the one who at the turn of the century, when he was designing a new kind of a building, something that had never ever existed in the world before, what we now call the skyscraper. He's considered to be the father, if you like, of the skyscraper. And he wrote in a magazine article, he was a man of great passion and, and, and firm belief in the, the need for creating things in the world that had integrity. So whether it be a sweeping eagle in his flight or an open apple blossom, the toiling workhorse, the blithe swan, the branching oak, the winding stream at its base, the drifting clouds all over all the coursing sun, form ever follows function and this is the law. And when people interpret that as style, they're forgetting what Martin Buber said about form. They're forgetting that everything belonging to the tree is in this, its form and structure, its colors and chemical composition, its intercourse with the elements and with the stars or are all present in a single whole. What we're doing and the, 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 the main characterization of design is integrity. We're trying to make one thing. We're not trying to make a leaf here and a branch there and a bit of bark here. We're trying to make a tree. And that level of integration of the elements is what nature does superbly. It doesn't evolve the leaf separate from the bark. It, it evolves a tree. And when we design whatever it is, whether it's a great building or an institution or a ritual, we're trying to create a single thing, a thing that has its own unity and its own singularity of form. And I think that's a, a key, key principle to, to bring from the disciplines that have been around for a while um, into these new disciplines that we're now uh, forming around, that, that, have, that are ethereal, that don't have the physicality of a tree or a pot or a piece of furniture. Right. So let me slow down there. <laughs> That's a that was a barrage. There's a lot. Uh, so I just love to hear any thoughts and uh, if anybody has any questions, but please feel free. I am especially appreciating your distinction between form and style. Um, but I'm wondering and would like to hear a little more about what you said about distortion in terms of style and communication. Uh, um, 
Well, you know, let's let's look at cars. You know, the, the most famously styled objects in our culture are cars. Um, and I'll pick on a particular period of cars because that's when car styling was really, really taken to what I would think of as um, ridiculous extremes. Cars were simply being styled to, to be ostentatious displays of wealth or aspiration to wealth, which is even worse. And I just think that's an incredibly inauthentic uh, expression an inauthentic meaning for an artifact that has its foundational utility of, of transportation and mobility. And there are so many wonderful ways to express the idea of mobility in a form that you don't have to go to huge tail fins and ostentation uh, of display. So that, that would be a, an example of it. I think we can do that. And I think, I mean, I don't know enough about institutional design and organizations, uh, but there are similar stylistic elements and stylistic expressions. We tend to take on, at times, certain things become fashionable. We use the word fashion in the same way. Fashion is all about style, but it's really not. The, this sweater is a highly utilitarian artifact. Um, and it's very hard in, in clothes to get away from that fashion. What is the fashion? Right? Why are we buying this? Well, because everybody else in is. Well, is that a good thing? Well, it is at some level. It's, it's about social cohesion. It's about keeping us together, about having a common story. But what happens when that story gets grossly distorted? We can't get away from style. Style is in everything because meaning is in everything we create. There's nothing we ever create we, we, we are meaning-making machines. That's what we are. We, we just make things up all the time. And you'll hear me use the word make things up. That's what we're doing. We're just making up the world out of our heads. So style, style can be misplaced and misused, and especially when it gets confused with design. That's really helpful. Thank you. Sure. Anything else? Well, I'll go on. So let me talk about the design object. Very often you'll hear me refer to as the object of design. I also refer to artifacts. And by the object of design, designers, you'll, this is much more common language amongst designers, is there's a particular thing they're designing and it's to, to they name it as the object of design, whether it's a physical object or or not, a user experience can be the object of design. A service it can be an object of design. Um, and the reason we, we name it as the object is because there are other things in the periphery that we have to be very, very uh, considerate of that are in the context of design. And the context of design is not the same as the object of design and it's really worth holding that distinction in mind. And there are very, many different kinds of objects all the way from physical, tangible, furry objects like the one on the left, top left. Uh, top middle is a patent for an art object I designed, but the patent is a separate object of design, which itself is designed by lawyers to convey a certain kind of meaning uh, and to, to particularly illustrate the product in a certain way that it can't be replicated. Um, the object on the right, the top right, is the actual object of design, but it wasn't the, ob the, the physical object, it was the interaction with the screen that was really the hard part of that design. Um, all the way down to you know, the bottom left is, an, is a, uh, a service that I designed around co-working. Co and, and within that service, part of the service was creating community structures, which were themselves the objects of design. So all of those things are separate. Within a service, there are many, many objects of design, including the service as a whole, uh, all the way down through technology where you have specifications for a certain kind of digital object, which in a, another project I did designing a software for managing photographs online, uh, we developed an artifact or an object called the pickle and we had to design specifically what kind of data a, a pickle should have and what it shouldn't have. Um, this was sort of a pre precursor to, to Instagram. So any kind of 
material, any kind of medium can be an object of design. Um, let me talk a little bit about function. We also have a fairly uh, narrow understanding uh, for a culture that's, that's so functionally driven, uh, we, we tend to, to have a very narrow understanding of it. Form follows function. What is the function that the form ought to follow? Well, there's been a lot of confusion about that. Um, so let, let me just break that down in terms of this one, uh, this one product uh, that you see on the screen. The utility is its function, right? It's what it does, what it does for it. It's a tool. If I've got a hammer, its function is to, is to knock nails in. Um, but the way it works, in this case, it's a GPS informing a, an antenna that translates information onto a screen, and there's a lot of technologies involved in making its work. Its operation is a, f is a function, right? It's, it, it's functional in the sense that it works in a particular way. A car works by, with an internal combustion engine or a motor. That's part of its functionality, but it's not the same as its utility. We're more and more in the world of user-centered design, uh, focused on an as a, 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 another function uh, of the function, which is the usability. How we use something is part of its functionality. We call we, we call it user friendliness. Adapting a, a an artifact, an object of design, to be approachable by the people who are going to engage with it, and that's called its usability. Uh, purpose is another thing, right? One thing is to have the utility of, a, of a, a product that helps me navigate, but its purpose might be to, to give me a better experience of driving, to make it so I don't have to worry before I leave uh, the home. And that's and purpose, as, as you hear me, you know, we're trying to translate our intentions, our purposes into the physical, into the real world. And, and that really is, is another aspect of function. And relationship is part of that as well. We talk about something being a function of A being a function of B, and that's a relationship. And relationship is another kind of function. And all those functionalities should follow the form, or the form should follow the, for those functions. And, and they should all be considered when we're designing, whether we're designing a navigation system or whether we're designing a, a new way of, of uh, organizing services in a, in a neighborhood. So just a, a word or two about intention. Um, you know, the word design in the English language carries heavily the, the, the notion of, it, of something being done with intention. We see it all the time. The Biden Supreme Court uh, Commission is designed to fail. It wasn't intended by its creators to work. Now, between you and me, I doubt they sit, sat down and did a very careful design process. I doubt they thought that what they were creating was something that could one day be called a design. But we talk about something that was designed for, to, to do something all the time. That what we really mean is intended. And so that's why I say design is how we give form to our intentions. That's really a beautiful, for me, a def definition of design. I just want to play you this American Life episode, a little snip about this, and you can spot what I call a, a, a supreme expression of design consciousness. And Daniela says, that seems like what the SAT is intended to do. It's meant to weed out, it's meant to gatekeep, in my opinion. And, and do you think of it as like, it's just sort of, accidentally keeping people out or you feel like it's designed to keep keep people like you out of those colleges mm, i don't think it's accidental because i think that by now the test has been around long enough to whether they could see patterns you know so i feel like maybe at first it was accidental but now if they are seeing constant consistent patterns of students with certain social economic backgrounds or ethnic backgrounds are doing not as good as others, then it has to be intentional. So the importance of viewing the term doing something by design as actually an act of design is that if it was done badly, as in the case of the design of the SAT, that's very, very easy to understand that it can be done better and differently by other people. 
but that the the if something is bad by design we have to question the intention of the designers and there is always a designer behind every artifact and the SAT is a supreme example of a of an artifact that doesn't quite meet uh, the the intention that we think it should have fit it's another one we design to fit things to other things right when I say I'm going to design a uh, a car, we're, tr we're trying to d design an object that fits my transportation needs, right? So that the word fit becomes very important. I design a suit, and what we know about suits, when, when you know, if, if you have a bespoke tailor designing a, a, a piece of clothing, they don't just make it and put it on and then you walk away. They make it and they fit it and then they take it off and they make it again and they fit it again until it really, really fits. That is really a wonderful, for me, uh, metaphor for the entire design process. We're constantly trying to fit one thing with another. We have an idea that this will fit really well. We try it out. It doesn't fit so well. We do it again. But what we're trying to do in the, our intention with each iteration is to try fit better. The other meaning of the word fit that I like in, in, in relationship to design is fitness for, for purpose, fitness for survival. Design as, and again, I'll, I'll go into this next week in some more depth, is, is a, uh, an expression of, of, of a, a survival technique we developed two million, three million years ago, where we found out that if we, cre if we create artifacts, uh, we can actually deliberately create artifacts that, that allow us to survive better and better and better. We're at a point where we're creating things that aren't necessarily in line, uh, aligned with that idea of fitness. We're making ourselves a little bit less fit for survival by the things we're creating, and that's problematic. But it doesn't mean that we shouldn't be designing things, it just means we should be designing them better and paying more attention to how we design at every level of the artifactual scale. Real, right? What is real? We're living in a artificial world, right? Right now where I'm sitting, everything, including my garden, which has some beautiful plants in it, was created. It at some point existed only in somebody's imagination. Not the plants themselves, but the way they're laid out, the way they're organized. So other than the original source of nature, Everything else started off as a piece of somebody's imagination. And in that sense, we make what we make reality. We are truly making this up. And I think it's really important for us to recognize it so that we can pay attention and make it up better. Artificial, you know, reality, AR, uh, virtual reality is it's only artificial in the sense that we haven't normalized ourselves to it yet. In the same way that we've begun to normalize ourselves to telephones. But how unreal is the idea that I can be speaking to you over a screen and you're sitting there and I'm sitting here and yet here we are engaged in interacting. This is part of a new reality. And when we're creating things, we're constantly creating a new reality. Whether we, no matter how virtual we think it is, we are creating the world that we live in. You know, we have to give serious consideration how, how etherealized we want to make that world. Is it good for us? Is it good design? But that's an entirely separate question than the one of whether it's real once we've put it out there and it can actually be experienced in, in, by, by ourselves as reality. Environment. We are... You know, we're living in what uh, geologists call the Anthropocene, and we're creating, we're, 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 we're paving over the planet. We're recreating Earth. That is the environment that we design within, and it's very important. I mean, you know, people talk about sustainable design. It, we only call some kinds of design sustainable because we've been doing most of the design we've been doing so long, for so long is unsustainable. 
but sustain yeah you know, people when when people first started talking about sustainable design they thought of it as another fashion as a as a trend oh we got you know we got this these people who do trendy sustainable design here and these people are doing the real serious stuff well that's not true we, we, we it's just a basic parameter we have to design things sustainably but that's not the same the environment isn't the same as context and when we design the designed object, there's always a context to it. And the context determines the meaning of the artifact, right? So this is a very famous uh, sculpture by a, uh, a Dada artist by the name of Marcel Duchamp. And he took a, an artifact that was designed for people to urinate in, and he put it in an art museum specifically to bring attention to that very thing that I started off with, that art isn't just the highest expressions. What makes it a high expression is was, it was put in a, a temple, if you like, a, a, a palace of, of high art. And so it became art. But its art was that you know, somebody who created well or poorly uh, for its initial function, which was urination. Context is everything. I like to say it's 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 really important. Um, you know, we've talked a bit about the why I don't uh, uh, like to talk about design problems, right? Because you know, people again, it's very very commonly referred to design is a problem solving discipline, but that assumes problems imp imply that there's a, a particular solution, and when you're creating new things, there is no particular solution. That's the ambiguity that we talked about earlier. There's, there's only solutions and ideas and ways of, sh of shifting the context so that whatever the need is might be better satisfied. Right? So I, I much prefer to call it a meeting a crea creative challenge. And the goal is adaptation. We're trying to adapt to our environments within a context. Technology is another one that we get really confused by, right? We tend to think of the thing at the top as technology and the bottom as a stone. But to make that stone tool at the bottom, which was made about a million and a half, about a million, one, yeah, about a million years ago, that particular one, um, required the most advanced technology of its day. And the, the, the advanced technology of its day was a technology called stone napping. K-N-A-P-P-I-N-G, right? And stone napping was the original manufacturing technology. It was how you use one stone to chip away at another stone to make a tool. And, you know, the entire stone age was built on stone napping, was the, was the high tech. We just happen to be living in an, in an age of digitization where, where we think of digital tools as technology and everything else as something else. But everything is technology. Conversations are a technology. Uh, you know, in the shamanic traditions, people talk about various healing modalities as technologies. So everything we do uh, that enables us to do something more than, than that, we, that we can just with our, our body as it is and our mind as it is, is a tool and the tool is based on a technology. So technology is capability, design is application. So when people say artificial, in uh, artificial intelligence is a technology that's going to take over, it'll only take over if we design it to. If we create applications that allow it to, that, that, make, other, that, that make it an agent of, 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 of uh, usurpation like that. We have intention around how we use our technologies and design is the medium, it's the vehicle that we apply to do that. Innovation is a very hot topic now and, and I, I've already talked a bit about this. Innovation really is the understanding that just making things up in our heads and even in prototypes is only the first part of the journey. Putting it out in the world and allowing it to be adopted is the second part. Replicating it and making many of them so that there's a supply chain is the last part. And so innovation really is one is the discipline and there really is a discipline. You can study innovation 
uh, sciences and uh, at, in very in many places today there are people who study innovation as a discipline in its own right uh, and and design thinking is very closely allied with that but technology innovation specifically carries that meaning of not just making something up but putting it out in the world uh, and and going through all the adoption hoops that it takes for for something to be become truly a part of our reality Uh, we've talked a lot about critique, I won't go into this, but critique is, to me, the art of naming the intention and recognizing the fit. And when there's not a good fit, understanding that and, under and start starting the process all over again to be able to improve it, to put that suit back on, make sure that it fits better. And now we're getting into some terms that really come out of design speak, design factors. Designers talk all the way about, about factors, business factors, technology factors, and human factors are usually the most common one. Environmental factors is one that has quite lately come to the, to the table. And they're all important. And in this diagram uh, that, that uh, IDEO created, uh, they understand that design is at the center of it, was how we do the integration between all the diverse factors. We can't design something that is technology, technologically great, but it, its human factors are awful. Um, now, human factors is itself a, a discipline of science and an, an applied discipline. There, there are people who study... My minor at, in college was human factors. I'm a major in product design with a minor in human factors and I tacked on design research because there wasn't such a thing at the time. But human factors started off as a, as a technical discipline, as, a, as a, simply a discipline that recognized that people are part, with machines are part of a system and so therefore to design a good system you had to understand the people part of it. And initially it was you know, applied to things like factories to make factories run faster and more efficient. Um, and to make airplanes more deadly uh, on attack and safer to fly. Uh, but today, human factors is the core discipline that's at the center of what we now call human-centered design. It's the systematic understanding of, of who we are as human beings and how we work in relationship to the artifactual or the, or the built environment. Uh, the other word that you'll often hear for human factors as a discipline is ergonomics. Right? So the chair I'm sitting in is an ergonomic chair, and that simply just means that a chair that was designed with human factors principles in mind for a particular task, for a particular function. Um, thankfully, we're also starting to broaden our understanding of what human function is, that we don't just see it simply in physiological terms or even in cognitive terms. We see it in the full spectrum of need that is always so, so easy to refer to the, the Maslow hierarchy uh, that I'm sure you're all familiar with. Uh, that really ends with self-actualization or, 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 or pinnacles with, with self-actualization, which again is why it's the part of the design disciplines that have been uh, woefully uh, unattended to. Uh, we generally relegate it to the work of great cathedrals and beautiful churches like the one we started, I started the presentation with. But self-actualization should be part of everything that we create. And again, I can't think of a better place to really raise the, the profile of that than in a school of theology. One way that we oversimplify the human factors is we, we think of the human body as that's, that's the measure of man. This was actually a product in the product design world that was you know, brought out in the 50s by the name of the measure of man when it was first uh, launched and later on they uh, changed the title to the measure of man and women. And it, and it covers the field that is known, it's a subdiscipline within human factors called anthropometrics. Measures, measures of the human body uh, and, and, its, and its strengths and its capabilities at reach and in motion, etc., etc. But it's a very, it's a very uh, measurement-based uh, uh, discipline. We're here studying human-centered design, but human-centeredness carries its own kinds of uh, meaning challenges, which is 
there are these other ways that we can relate to the human being that we're trying to design for. And very often uh, it's called a user-centered, which reduces us to users of something, which is better than when we weren't considering users. It's, it's better than when we, we were designing uh, chairs that were just completely distorted relative to the human body or computers that really didn't work the way that our, our cognition works. Uh, so we, d we created the term user-centered, but it's narrow and it's limited, and it's very important to understand that there are other, other ways that we exist in relationship to the built environment. Um, Customer-centered was even worse. That was just the assumption that everybody is going to be a customer of something. Everyone's going to be, you only create things to be bought. Um, and once you've bought it, you, you have no more responsibility. You have no more, more uh, uh, intent. Um, and that obviously was a very, uh, th th that's the kind of uh, principle that leads to the kind of styling that I talked about earlier, where you have a lot of mismatch between meaning and, and, and authentic, authentic values of, of the, in the context. Um, I would propose we, we design for things to be citizen-centered or community-centered or any other kind of center where you feel that people can fully be uh, exist in, in the, the fullness of, of their humanity. Design criteria. Designers are always referring to the criteria to which you design. The principles or standards by which design may be critiqued and evaluated. Uh, design organizations in corporations, in, all, in large you know, innovation organizations, always need to have specifications to work to, the measures that they're trying to, the measurable conditions that the design must meet when they're done. Um, and marketing departments and engineering departments have all kinds of specification and requirements doc documents that they demand before they allow a design team to actually start on, on creating anything. It's a way of keeping things really efficient and targeted and focused. It doesn't talk much about intention. Very few of these design marketing requirements documents or engineering requirements documents ever talk about intention. They might refer to function, but not so much to intention. And a very big category, the design principles that we apply when we're designing things. Because one of the things that we're learning over time as we design things, more and more kinds of things, and we, we, we broaden our, our discipline of human factors is we start understanding that there are there are core principles that we always work to um, now most of these principles have been developed thinking of physical hardware kind of products or software products or or digital products of some kind um, but the reality is many of them can be applied to the kinds of artifacts that we're here to create and we need to start doing the work of expanding them, extending them, of creating new principles out of the fields of organizational design, out of the fields of, uh, of policy, uh, etc. What makes good policy? What makes bad policy? What makes a good organization bad organization? What makes a, a good uh, community or a bad community? Uh, what makes these things work? And knowing them as, as, as principles before we even start designing is very helpful. This course is not a course in, in, in principles. That would be just way too much to, to absorb. But I hope that we, that we begin to understand the kinds of principles that drive, that we need to be looking for. So I'll just give you a few out of the, the standard texts that's, that are used to design, to, to educate uh, sort of digital designers and product designers of all kinds. Um, affordance, the d design aspect of an object which suggests how the object might be used, a visual clue to its function and use, right? So this was actually a principle that came forward when things started to get digital and suddenly there was no, we, we had to re realize that when we design the physical world, we already intuitively know about affordances. For example, the one that you all know about, that's, that's used as an example in this book, um, is when you walk up to a door, if it's got a knob, you know to turn the knob. If it's got a handle, you know to turn the handle down. You know how to handle it just by the affordance that this shape suggests how you hold it and what you do with it. When you walked up to swinging doors in a building and it's got just a plate on it, you know to push. 
But if it's got a, a, one of those handles that sticks out, you know to pull, right? You don't think there's no instruction set that this says pull or push. Sometimes it does. But usually it does say that when, when you walk up to a door that you're supposed to pull, but it, but it actually only has a plate on it or vice versa. And then you, it needs to, to give you a verbal instruction. If it has to give you a verbal instruction, it's probably that the design has failed. So again, think about that as we design the kinds of things that you're going to be designing. What are, what are its affordances? How do people know what to do with it just by the nature of its design? Consistency. This was a, something we, we, we learned the hard way when, when we went from uh, you know, mechanical keyboards uh, to digital ones. And people said, you know, with, you know, the original mechanical keyboard was designed um, around the mechanism that, you know, the reason we spread the keys out in a strange QWERTY uh, type uh, format is to keep certain keys that are pressed uh, a lot away from each other so that when the, the strikers would hit the, the, the ribbon, they wouldn't get all jammed up. That's, that's why the QWERTY keyboard exists in its form that, that we know it. And so when digital designers started saying, oh, we can design a keyboard because it's all digital now, and they rearranged it, and there's, there's many keyboards out there. There's the one I'm showing here is called the Dvorak keyboard. Um, they're more efficient, they work better. Uh, people can, can actually type faster if they learn them. But because there's so much legacy of keyboards that are just out there and everybody, you know, is, how, when do we stop and say, you can, you got to stop, you know, like in, in, in Europe, there was a time when uh, some, some countries drove on the left and some countries drove on the right. And to get everybody aligned so they're driving on the same side so they didn't crash when they crossed the border, you know, took a major effort. In this country, we're trying to get from, from, met, uh, from the old imperial measurements to metric. It's not going to happen. Americans won't go for that. They also wouldn't go for the a redesign of the keyboard. There needs to be a consistency of behavior that's expected. It's a difficult one because sometimes you really want to break the old habits and then you need to recognize that and take it on as a, as a, a challenge in its own right. And again, creating institutions, creating the kinds of things we're talking about here, rituals, think about what, what we're drawing from. You know, our traditions are full of rituals that were consistent with the, the generation before them. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to get into, into school theology. I'll be careful there, so I'll, I, I won't say more about that. Um, error. You know, we talk about human error in, the, in, in a product. Well, the, the fellow who wrote this book, the, Don Norman, The Design of Everyday Things, has a chapter that says, human error, no, bad design. And there is an, a, a philosophy of design that says there is no such thing as human error. There's just bad the design that doesn't work very well. Because the whole point of design is to allow anybody to use it. And if anybody can't use it, you know, that, that's a problem. Uh, that attitude is the one that has dictated the design of very um, risk-sensitive uh, environments, things like nuclear power plants, uh, things like aeroplane cockpit interiors, where there has to be enough redundancy that such a thing as human error actually can't work, can't happen. It does, but <laughs> that's, the, that's the, the, the philosophy and the attitude. Mapping, um, I think the, the, the image speaks for itself. And again, the qu question I suggest you ask yourself is how, when you're designing whatever you're designing, how does how do people's mental model of what of the world map onto whatever the, the thing you're creating? How can they, they, they just be led to expect that because they know which part of the chair that, you know, they're trying to adjust, that to make the, 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 adjust, the adjustment uh, controls in the shape of the chair? How do you map one function onto another control? So we're making it up, Design for Social Change. It's a discipline that is coming into being. Um, it's slowly finding its own principles. They, you can look at some of the websites that I've posted to, to uh, Miro uh, that, that show projects and begin to discuss some of the, the, the principles that people are uh, starting to stumble into and articulate um, as, as the discipline unfolds.
What are the design objects of social change? What forms do they take? And where do we look for the design principles, the criteria, the spe specifications to be applied in shaping them? Those are the questions that I'll leave you with.